Good morning, everyone. Uh, today, we are going to talk about um, venous venous uh, ECMO support uh, for patients with respiratory failure. And this um, hour, we are going to talk largely about the nuts and bolts, all right, uh, so that uh, everyone uh, can be familiar with the, the ECMO system, as well as uh, to be able to troubleshoot the, some common uh, scenarios and understand the, the physiology of how the patient behaves uh, when they are on the ECMO. And uh, this will not uh, be a talk that focuses a lot on the literature behind the uh, ECMO because I think uh, we don't really have that much uh, time. So this is the outline of the lecture talk today. We're going to briefly go through the different uh, forms of extracorporeal life support, which is the umbrella term that's used to cover the different uh, kind of uh, ECMO or even extracorporeal uh, CO2 removal devices. Um, it's very important to understand uh, what is the uh, circuit uh, connection for it in the in some details regarding pumps, pipes, um, plumbing. Um, it's important for you all to understand about the ECMO physiology because the, um, the, the aim or goals of ECMO support is a little bit different uh, compared to when they're just on conventional mechanical ventilation. And uh, we'll go through some of the uh, management uh, when they are on the ECMO support and including the lastly, the, some of the common uh, complications and troubleshooting that you can do when uh, you are called uh, to review an ECMO patient. So I think uh, from a broad concept standpoint, uh, I think everyone is aware that ECMO by itself is not um, therapeutic. It is a bridge uh, to recovery in most of the circumstances in which we implemented uh, ECMO. In certain the situation, as well as in certain overseas centers, uh, ECMO can be a bridge uh, to transplant, be it heart or lung transplant. In certain situations, we are, un uh, we are unclear about the trajectory of the patient's uh, progress. The ECMO can be a bridge to a further the decision until a more definitive uh, long-term plan has been made. This is a broad category of um, uh, classification of ECLS. So on the left is what we commonly encounter the, in the National Heart Center as well as the SGH. In medical ICU, we support uh, patients largely on the VV ECMO for respiratory the failure. And in cardiothoracic unit, majority of the patients will be on VA ECMO, which are able to provide both circulatory as well as respiratory failure to support. There are the situations where we need a hybrid mode, where we need the high flow, the venous access. So these are termed the VVA ECMO, and it's very uncommon that you're going to see this uh, in our unit. These are some of the common indications for venous venous uh, ECMO. All right. Uh, so we institute VV ECMO for those patients that we think they have a potential to recover relatively the quickly because they suffer from some um, reversible life-threatening form of respiratory the failure. And the common prototype for disease entity that we support are patients with acute the respiratory distress uh, syndrome, uh, either secondary to infection, aspiration, or sometimes uh, direct uh, trauma. Occasionally, we support the patients with severe the status as medicals or the patients in severe exacerbation or COPD, where actually they failed conventional the treatment and they have a severe the hypercapnia. Um, occasionally, we've been asked uh, to support patients who have uh, some form of upper airway the obstruction due to tumors, uh, due to extrathoracic compression of the airway. And this is often in the context of a peri the procedural or even a perioperative uh, period. Uh, in the context of lung transplant, in the patients uh, who have undergone the transplant and their lungs are still the, uh, trying to recover the, from the uh, perioperative event, uh, what we term primary graft uh, dysfunction. This is some of the things that is uh, actually the, quite commonly done the, in the lung transplant uh, centers. This is the only the uh, this is the uh, basic anatomy of the ECRS uh, circuitry, and we go through. Uh, each component in the, some of the details uh, later on, because it's very important you understand how the ECMO the circuit is being connected. So the blood is actually taken from the venous uh, system and uh, it's able to do so because there is a pump that actually provides the negative uh, pressure to draw the blood from the patient's uh, body. And the blood is then uh, pumped uh, through a membrane, an artificial membrane, which works like the artificial lung. And uh, gas and um, oxygen is supplied through uh, a, the, the water panel to, uh, in the ICU, and there will be a mixing of the oxygen and carbon dioxide through their concentration the gradient, and the blood is then the pumped back to the patient's uh, body in the venous uh, system. Right? So this is a very basic anatomy of the ECLS uh, circuit. So this is the work cause of the ECMO circuit, uh, which is the centrifugal the pump. All right, it's termed a centrifugal because um, the blood, uh, the, the motor actually spins in a centrifugal fashion. And when it does so, the, it creates a gradient between the inflow and the outflow. And it is this a pressure gradient that actually created, creates the uh, 
the ability for the blood to be sucked out of the body and then pumped back uh, to the patient's uh, body. There's a few characteristics of centripetal pump that you have been aware of. All right? So unlike uh, some of our the CKRT, the circuit, which is a roller pump, this is a non-occlusive uh, pump, all right? so the, which basically means that when the pump suddenly the stop, uh, the blood will actually the flow backwards. All right? So the, when the, there is necessity for you to change up the pump or change up the circuit, you need to clamp the lines to prevent uh, this uh, blood uh, backflow. This pump is also very the preload and afterload the dependent, which basically means that uh, they are sensitive uh, to the volume the available for the pump inlet, which is what we call by preload dependent. And it's also the very sensitive to any resistance at the pump uh, outlet. This means that if there's any the obstruction, the kinking, it they can actually interrupt the, uh, the pump and you'll get the fluctuations in the motor flow. And, and the uh, the other the characteristics of a centripetal pump is that uh, you are not really to be able to actually predict how much of flow you are going to achieve with the revolution the per minute that you set, right? Uh, so this is unlike a roller pump where you can get some the consistent the linear relationship between the speed of the RPM and the amount of blood that you're going to achieve. So the for uh, centripetal pump, you need to actually titrate the uh, RPM at the bit side and see what kind of a flow you are able to achieve. And uh, we have means to monitor the, the blood flow um, through the sensor that's attached, either integrated with the ECMO circuit or as an ex uh, external ultrasonic the flow sensor that's clicked onto the cannula, which can detect um, using the ultrasound the Doppler signal to actually estimate the, the blood flow that's achieved uh, in your cannula. And how we actually manipulate uh, the revolution to per minute and also to get some sense of the blood flow is through the uh, control the cons uh, console. And the console that uh, you will see depends on really the devices that we use in the circuit uh, in the uh, ICU. So this is rather the old uh, circuit uh, and it's very, very the simple. There's only the few the indicators and a big knob for you to actually manipulate. So the, the knob is usually used to change revolution to per minute which is reflected by these uh, high the thousands of numbers here. And um, beside it is usually the a flow, the meter. All right, so as you increase or decrease the revolution the per minute, you'll get a different flow depending on the, the preload, afterload, as well as the kind of a cannula the, that you have. All right, and uh, so as I mentioned earlier on, the, the, you can also attach a ultrasonic the flow sensor. And this sensor could be attached to an external the monitor to give you the further information about the other indicators of your ECMO the, uh, sufficiency, which may include things like saturations of your um, blood. Um, and um, the external monitors can also be hooked up uh, to various uh, pressure points so that you can measure the different uh, pressure at the different uh, areas of the circuit. So as I was alluding to, the pressure monitor is actually a very important component of um, measuring, uh, of assessing the uh, ECMO the circuit and the, for troubleshooting of uh, events. So the, this is a schematic of how the ECMO circuitry uh, is connected uh, to the patient. So in this particular setting, the patient has a double lumen uh, cannula and the rate denotes uh, the uh, returned cannula. So this is the oxygenated blood after it has passed through the membrane oxygenator. And the blue basically refers to the excess of cannula, which is mainly draining the deoxygenated the blood. So anything before the pump, which is where my arrow is, is negative for pressure. All right? And that's the only way in which the blood can be drawn out from the patient's body. So when it's a negative for pressure, any disconnection in this area will result in atmospheric air sucking into the system and introducing the air within the um, motor circuit. And if this air pass through the membrane oxygenator and back to the patient, then you will have uh, problems with um, uh, air embolism. Uh, in contrast, in the circuitry that's after the pump, all these are positive for pressure the system. So if you have a disconnection in this area, you will result uh, in the massive uh, blowout and the patient will uh, quickly exsanguinate uh, to death. All right, if you don't address this quickly. Because if you can uh, imagine, the ECMO flow is typically the range of between the three to five liters per minute. So the, very quickly, your whole cardiac output uh, will be sanguinated if uh, there is any disconnection in the uh, positive pressure the segment. And different areas of the circuitry will also allow us to actually transduce the pressure so that we can assess uh, the venous excess pressure 
the pre-oxygenator the pressure as well as the post-oxygenator the pressure. And the, it really depends on the, the circuit that you are working with. Some of the circuit does not really tell you what is the venous excess pressure. And all you have is the pre-oxygenator as well as the post-oxygenator pressure. Uh, if you have all three information, it's very helpful because you know the what the alarms uh, may be resulting for by looking at the different uh, pressure. But all the circuit will have at least a pre and post oxygenator the pressure. And that is usually reflected as the delta the pressure that you see in the top right hand the corner. And this delta pressure actually the reflects uh, the pressure gradient across the oxygenator membrane. And you can use it to actually trend uh, the amount of uh, deposition as well as the uh, trombin formation uh, around the uh, uh, oxygenator the circuit. And this can help you to actually predict if um, the patient is having a lot of clot issue and whether the, you're going to lose the efficiency of your membrane oxygenator. The membrane oxygenator is the artificial lung of the motor circuit and it comes in different uh, shape, size and spells uh, uh, configuration. So, so on the left hand corner, this is the uh, um, quadrinox uh, um, membrane oxygenator. It's a squarish kind of a setup. And on the, the middle the picture, you have uh, the, um, the EIS the system where it's a cylindrical the column, all right? Uh, and regardless of uh, what kind of shape comes in, most of the modern oxygenator are made up of material that is termed the polymetal, the pentane. So these are hollow the fiber, the structure. Blood will actually flow between the fibers and gas will actually flows within the hollow, the fibers. And uh, there is a lot of surface area for contact points so that uh, your oxygen and gas exchange occurs uh, very uh, rapidly. And gas uh, exchange uh, basically occurs uh, by diffusion down their concentration uh, gradient. The cannulas and the tubings are important component and uh, this needs to be gotten uh, right at the time of the cannulation. So these are some of the cannulas uh, that uh, you will see us uh, using in the, uh, in the National Heart uh, Center. You can roughly the classify them as a multi-stage or single-stage cannula. Multi-stage basically means that they have multiple the perforators along the lines. And these perf perforators actually help uh, to actually drain the blood out uh, from, the, uh, from the vessels uh, into the cannula itself. And usually it's used uh, as a venous uh, cannula. Typically, it's much uh, longer the, in length as compared to the arterial the cannula. For the return to cannula, we tend to, uh, to use the single stage. Basically, there's only one to, or one or two perforators at the tip. And um, because this is the uh, return to draining, uh, return to cannula, we do not really need multiple the perforators uh, for this to work. And most of the return to cannulas are generally the shorter the in length. We do have uh, occasionally use uh, what we term the dual lumen cannula. It's a single cannula placed inside a large vessel and the cannula that has actually two lumen to allow the, for drainage as well as uh, for return the bio to separate the lumen within the same the cannula. So you only need a single the cannulation the site and that can potentially reduce the amount of uh, um, peri the procedural the complications associated uh, with uh, insertion. Uh, and if you insert it in the right IJ, you can free up the grind so that patient can do early the mobilization uh, easily. All right, this is uh, a little bit more costly. And uh, in terms of the placement, they need to be more, more uh, guided uh, by either trans thoracic uh, echo or by fluoroscopy because the return the uh, cannula needs to be directed uh, through the tricuspid valve so that uh, you can minimize the amount of recirculation, which is the mixing of the drainage as well as the uh, return the blood so that uh, we do not lose the efficiency of the circuit. And I'll go through what recirculation is uh, in, uh, later on. And uh, all the cannulas are reinforced by wires and they're very, very large uh, cannulas, all right? So they are significantly larger than uh, what we place for vast calf. So a vast calf is typically around uh, 12 to 14 uh, French. Uh, for cannulas uh, that we use for ECMO, it can be three times the size of the venous um, veins uh, in the millimeters. So if you have a... Uh, 10 millimeters of vein, you can accommodate up to a 30 French uh, cannula. And this is the way that we actually estimate uh, what size of cannula the, you're going to use. Right? So the, before the cannulation, the surgeons will actually measure the diameter of the, the veins that they're going to cannulate. And then you multiply by three, and that will tell you roughly what's the maximal um, size of the cannula that you can actually uh, use for that particular uh, vein. 
And it's important that, that we know the relationship between the amount of blood flow, the pressure gradient drop that you're going to encounter um, in relationship to the cannula, the size. Because this is going to determine how much of blood flow you can reasonably achieve with the cannula size that uh, you are going to insert. So in the, for ICU, for venous-venous uh, uh, cannulation, heart centers actually standardize uh, their drainage cannula to size uh, 21 French. So if you look at the blue curve right at the top, so this will tell you that with a 21 the French catheter, you want to achieve a blood flow around the four liters, you're going to end up with a pressure drop of around uh, uh, 80 millimeters, uh, 60 to 80 millimeters mercury. And that number is important because the higher the pressure, the drop, the higher the risk that you're going to run into thrombolysis as blood is forced uh, through the tip of the cannula. Right. So if you want to achieve much higher blood flow of five to six liters, no doubt you can actually increase your RPM to try to create more negative uh, pressure, but you're going to end up with a pressure drop of uh, approximately the up to uh, 90 or 100 millimeters of mercury drop. And that would mean that uh, the patient would have a significant risk of uh, thrombolysis. So right from the word go, you're going to estimate that the patient requires a blood flow of, let's say, the six liters. Then you will want to actually to use a much larger size cannula so that you can achieve that blood flow um, without causing too much pressure drop. For the outflow cannula or to return the cannula, this is less of importance. So typically, our surgeons will insert a size 19 the French cannula for the purpose of return to the patient's venous system. So the next component is the gas uh, blender. So the, these are actually the connected to the wall panel, the medical supply gas, as well as the oxygen that's supply. The blender allows you to titrate the concentration of the oxygen that you're supplying the patient. For VVN mode, typically we just put at uh, a FI of 1.0. And even during the weaning process, we usually don't uh, titrate this level. We just keep at FI02 of one. Uh, the column on the right is the flow meter, and it can go up to 10 liters uh, per minute of uh, gas uh, sweet flow, uh, and as well as to less than the one the liters. So the extreme, the left-hand corner, are in, milli, uh, are in milliliters. Right? So the, if you put the right side all the way down to zero and you increase up the left-hand corner, you can actually do minute uh, supply. And this is usually for the purpose of neonatal the support, for example or we are doing extreme the weaning the, for patients uh, who needs to be weaned very, very the slowly. Because um, uh, the blood are actually extracted out from the patient's uh, body and exposed to the atmosphere, you do need to have some means of um, uh, warming up the um, blood so that the, the patient do not go into hypothermia. And this is of particular the importance for neonatal as well as a pediatric uh, patient. So this, um, the... There's uh, actually a water bath that's usually the cited the, at the right at the bottom on the whole the ECMO the cup and it's connected to the membrane oxygenator so that the blood is actually warm before they return the back to the patient. And you can also use this water bath for heat exchanger to actually uh, artificially the, control the patient's uh, body the temperature for the specific uh, purpose of decreasing the oxygen the demand. Um, and in the patients that you want to do target temperature management, for example, in patients with post cardiac arrest, it can also be used to actually to regulate uh, temperature for neuroprotective uh, purpose. Uh, and rarely we use it as a means of uh, fever to control. This also means that when the patients are artificially the, uh, have their temperature to control, uh, fever may be something that is, can be masked. So if you need to have a low index of suspicion, to, if you find that there are certain to, uh, other to signs and symptoms of uh, nosocomial to fever when they're on ECMO. So when you put everything together in a cart, this is what it will look like. And the picture on the left uh, will show you what it looks like from the front. And the picture on the left, uh, right, shows you what it looks like uh, when everything's assembled. Right? So you're usually the water heater is at the bottom, the console is at the top. Um, nowadays, we usually put the flow meter at the side of the patient. There are multiple other pressure sensors that can is attached uh, to the machine itself. And at the back, you will see that the oxygenator is uh, so for this purpose, we are using Equinox and it's connected uh, to the, the water uh, heat exchanger. And the pump itself is usually situated close to a, um, a reserve a hand crank. So this is actually the backup in case there's a primary failure with the graph itself so that you can actually detach uh, this component put it back to the hand crank and manually uh, rotate the hand crank so that you can uh, go back to the same blood flow as what the patient was doing before the failure of the pump. 
right? So this is a, a life uh, saving uh, design so that uh, in the event of pump failure, the patient still uh, is able to get um, uh, support uh, through the uh, manual uh, cranking. So you have to make sure that when this is assembled, the pump itself is situated very close to the hand crank. So there's minimal the movement that's needed uh, when we want to detach this and place it on the hand crank. In terms of uh, how the VV ECMO is being uh, configured, so these are the three common uh, VV ECMO configurations that you're going to see in most of our uh, VV ECMO uh, patients. Um, the right-hand side is the Vino Venus uh, um, configuration, which is by far the more common configurations our cardiothoracic uh, surgeons uh, uh, prefer, especially if the patients are retrieved uh, from another institution because it's easier from a transport uh, standpoint. So what they do is that they will they'll cannulate the uh, venous, the, the common femoral the vein, and uh, usually the excess uh, drainage is usually situated uh, a bit lower, while the return the cannula is actually situated uh, much higher. Uh, in our local context, we tend to place the venous uh, cannula, the drainage uh, cannula on the uh, right uh, common femoral the vein, as it is a straighter the that you're going to encounter issues with kinking and obstruction. And the return the cannula is placed on the right uh, common the femoral the vein. And uh, the two cannula tips are usually placed uh, close to the central circulation. So they are usually situated at the infra the, uh, intra the hepatic the IVC or even the, to the right the atrium. Uh, we tend not to go the, too deep in the right atrium in order to avoid the, uh, perforation or causing the pericardial the tamponade. The other two are less common configurations, um, but uh, you see them the, deployed the, occasionally, either because there are issues with femoral the cannulations or they, um, uh, there are specific purpose why we want to actually the, do it a bit differently. So the, the current uh, MO patients of, for COVID-19 uh, the pneumonia, you'll see that uh, she has actually a double lumen cannula at the right, the IJ. Right? Uh, this is a little bit different uh, from the um, cannulas that we used to use in the past because this specific cannula that is used uh, for the, this particular patient is actually the meant for right heart support. So the tip actually goes all the way to the pulmonary artery. All right? So in this way, the blood is drawn uh, from the... Um, uh, IVC and then the pump directly into the PA. All right. So in this uh, way, the, actually the, we avoid uh, recirculation the, altogether because there's no mixing of the two circulation at all. Uh, but uh, in other forms of duma lumen, uh, it's very important that the tip of the cannula as well as the uh, return the uh, cannula is directed in a specific configuration so that the uh, uh, recirculation the, do not uh, occur. And this is how it looks like uh, for some of our patients with a uh, severe ARDS. Basically, you don't really see much lung. And if you are doing a femoral to femoral to approach, the two cannulas will be seen to coming up uh, from the bottom. Sometimes with just a chest x-ray, you can only see the returned uh, cannula and, and you can hardly make up the uh, drainage cannula. This is usually situated much lower so that uh, we can avoid uh, some uh, uh, recirculation. So we do need to do a abdominal x-ray to look at where the, adult, uh, the drainage uh, cannula is situated. Okay, so the next uh, segment, uh, we're going to talk about the physiology of uh, ECMO to support, and there will be some uh, basic uh, mathematics uh, involved. So just bear with me. For those with gone through ICU, I think we talked a lot about uh, oxygen de delivery because uh, the definition of shock is when your oxygen consumption exceeds your oxygen de delivery. And oxygen delivery is actually dependent on the amount of uh, oxygen content uh, in the blood. And this is a basic uh, formula in which the oxygen content in the blood multiplied by your cardiac output will give you the oxygen uh, delivery. And the oxygen uh, content can be further um, uh, detailed in this uh, mathematical uh, formula where the saturation of the blood multiplied by the hemoglobin multiplied by the, the uh, hemoglobin the content uh, plus whatever the PaO2 that's dissolved in the blood, All right? So that will give you the oxygen content uh, in the system that you are providing support for. So if this is ECMO, then the, the higher the concentration that you can achieve with the gas membrane, if you can maximize your hemoglobin content, you're going to get a much better oxygen uh, delivery through the ECMO the circuit uh, itself. The cardiac output is actually the, in the intrinsic 
uh, uh, system without ECMO. This basically is uh, determined by preload, heart rate, contractility, as well as the vascular the resistance. In ECMO itself, uh, these do play a role because some of these uh, factors like preload uh, will actually uh, determine how much of blood flow you can achieve through the ECMO the circuit. All right? But uh, in ECMO circuit, this is actually basically refers to the blood flow. Right, so if you think about it, the, the amount of support that you can achieve on the ECMO circuit is largely actually the determined by how much uh, blood flow you can achieve and how much you can optimize uh, from a hemoglobin standpoint. And you want to make sure that the membrane oxygen is functioning as, uh, as, as efficient as possible so that the saturations of the blood that goes through it uh, can reach 100% as, uh, as much as possible. And uh, so this is just a diagram to show that the hemoglobin actually plays a very important uh, role in oxygen to delivery. So we have two the curve, uh, two bar, uh, two curve here. So the one in green basically refers to when you have the patient's uh, blood, the hemoglobin is about 15. It's compared uh, to when the patient's the hemoglobin is 7.5, which is half of that of the green line. So for the same the blood flow, you can see that the oxygen delivery is actually much higher if your HP is actually the higher. All right, it's double that. All right, so it's very simple to understand if you just go back to the earlier oxygen delivery to the equation. So, of course, uh, ECMO circuit does not uh, work uh, in alone because it's actually configured in, in, in the series with the, uh, with the lung. But what this means that a uh, portion of the systemic circulation is actually drawn out goes past the ECMO the circuit and then it's returned back to the RV and it will actually mix with the remaining of the circulation that does not go through the ECMO circuit and all this will pass through the lung and then returns back to the left heart the circulation to be circulated to the rest of the systemic the circulation. This basically means that the total oxygen delivery is not just dependent on the ECMO circuit but also on the lung as well. So, but the, in the initial phase of the ECMO support, uh, you will see that the lung component is actually the very, very the minute because the lung is actually in severe failure. So a large component of the ECMO circuit is actually achieved uh, through the ECMO the circuit and very little the contribution to, from the lung. But obviously as the lung recovers, there will be more contribution and the ECMO the circuit can be subsequently be win and, uh, and then they finally will let the lung uh, take over and the ECMO circuit uh, can be removed. So this concept of how much goes through the ECMO circuit and how much goes through the intrinsic the lung, basically that is very important because in a patient uh, with a very hyperdynamic uh, circuit, uh, uh, hyperdynamic uh, situation, uh, there will be a very high the cardiac output the state, but uh, the amount of uh, blood that you can actually the, um, extract uh, and go through the ECMO circuit is relatively the fixed one if you optimize the ECMO the flow through your current uh, configuration. Right? So if the patient develops a sepsis, uh, tyrotoxicosis, patient's high fever, then a significant more proportion of the intrinsic uh, systemic circulation will go through the lung and less uh, through the ECMO circuit. So when you mix more deoxygenated blood with the oxygenated blood through the ECMO, then obviously the amount of uh, saturations in your arterial the system will drop. Right? So this is what we term the blood flow to the cardiac output uh, ratio. And theoretically, you want to achieve a ratio of about 0 0.6 to actually the, uh, to reach a saturation that is uh, in, the, in the arterial system to be sufficient enough uh, for ECMO to support. So when we initially to want to estimate how much of blood uh, flow we want to achieve, this is the number that we actually look at. So, so we want to achieve a blood flow or estimated blood flow around 50 to 80 mils per kg for a per meter. So if you have, a, let's say, a 70 kilo the guy, so you want to achieve a blood flow of of actually the close to three to 4.5 liters of uh, blood flow, right? And if you can remember the graph that I showed you about the cannular size. So if you want to achieve a blood flow around 3.5 to about 4.5 liters, then you need to work backwards to see what is the size of the cannula that you need to choose so that uh, you can minimize the pressure drop to achieve the blood flow that you're going to obtain. So once you put in the cannula, there's very little much more you can actually uh, uh, in, increase in terms of blood flow. You'll hit the limit because that limit is the pressure the drop. So you need to choose the cannula size very carefully for the uh, type of patients that you're going to support. In a very obese uh, patient, this number will be on the higher end. So you need to anticipate that you need a larger the cannula to support the whole the cardiac output uh, for the patient. So what actually determines the ECMO flow? So earlier on, uh, we have mentioned that um, the 
pump is very the preload as well as afterload the dependent. So when talking about preload, that basically means how much of volume of blood you're you going to extract from the venous system. So that is actually determined by largely by intravascular volume and the relative to your venous uh, uh, caliber. So if you have uh, patients with normal volume and large uh, veins, of course, you can able to achieve much better blood flow as compared to a patient with a small vein and uh, also hypovolemic due to whatever reasons. You're going to end up uh, with uh, excess insufficiency and you get a lot of uh, chattling the problem. Uh, we have talked a lot about cannula, so I will skip that. The pump rate is the one that is largely determined how much negative pressure you're going to generate uh, to extract uh, the, to create the negative uh, pressure system that is used to uh, create the flow. But uh, obviously, I've already mentioned that this uh, comes at a certain uh, limit. It's much simpler the, in the context of CO2 the, uh, physiology because carbon dioxide uh, removal is actually very efficient in more the circuit. We can estimate the CO2 production, and that is usually the, in the patients with a VQ of uh, close to one, that would actually the, be very close to O2 the consumption. And because the CO2 clearance uh, is very efficient due to the uh, small molecule size and the solubility as well as diffusibility through the membrane, so it is usually not limited by the blood flow. All right, so in this graph, where the upper dotted line shows a uh, patient with a VQ the matching of one, you can see that uh, in order to extract a blood flow uh, CO2 clearance around 120 to 150, you actually need the very, very low the blood the flow. Right? So this is actually the, just means that the blood flow itself is usually not the limiting factor. So the limiting factor of CO2 clearance is largely by the size of your membrane uh, oxygenator, how much a sweet gas that you are the blowing, right? Because the more that you create a negative gradient between the CO2 content and the blood, the CO2 content, the higher the amount of CO2 extraction you can achieve, all right? Uh, and uh, in ECMO, the circuit, because the blood are warmed and when it um, forms a condensate, you, especially on the gas side of the membrane lung, you will lose the gradient for the CO2 transfer. So sometimes uh, what uh, the perfusion is our, uh, our the um, bedside nurses do that you can flush the sweet gas to a very high flow so that you can clear away the condensate and that will actually help you to remove uh, this uh, gradient and uh, achieve much better the CO2 the clearance. Right, so the, if you understand the ECMO the physiology, then the, we can talk about the, how are we going to support the patient when they're on ECMO. So the basic principle in respiratory failure is that the, you want to support this patient as much as possible through the ECMO circuit, and you want to minimize the amount of damage that potentially can be done uh, when you are ventilating the patient at positive uh, pressure. So when we put them on ECMO, what uh, the first thing you're going to do is to minimize the amount of uh, ventilator support uh, to a low level so that uh, we can achieve lung rest while the ECMO circuit support the patients and gas exchange. So what we mean by lung rest is basically we adopt an ultra low to, um, volume to lung protective uh, strategy. And that may mean that uh, we put these patients on very, very low to airway the pressure. Uh, we do keep them on certain minimal PEEP so that uh, we can avoid the total atelectasis. The patient doesn't really need the high the FiO2, and we generally ventilate this patient at very low the respiratory the rate, right? So the, you may hear about the rule of ten, all right? Basically, we put in a respiratory of ten, P of ten, driving pressure of ten. So the total airway pressure is about close to um, twenty, and the FI we just put it down to as low as we can tolerate. So the, with this, the tidal volume that is actually achieved is actually very low, and sometimes they are just in the teens. All right, so they could be at one mini meals, um, milliliters uh, per ideal body weight. And that is fine because uh, as long as we can uh, ventilate as much well oxygenate through the ECMO the circuit, we want to achieve this ultra low protective uh, strategy. Right? And as the lung starts to improve, you will see that the tidal volume will start to increase with the same amount of driving pressure. And that's one way that we actually monitor for lung recovery, besides uh, looking at the patient's clinical states, radiological features, as well as the uh, arterial the gas improvement. So this is the target that we want to achieve for most of our patients because there's always some A mixing term with the intrinsic system that does not go through the ECMO circuit. We do not expect our SPO2 to be very fantastic. 
All right, so the, in most of the ECMO the guidelines, you see that as long as you can achieve a PaO2 of around 80 to 85, most of the time that would be sufficient from an oxygenation standpoint because you are able to achieve a PaO2 of about 50 to 80 with a SpO2 of about 80 to 85. Um, we do want to keep the sweet gas uh, um, in the initial the phase uh, to be similar to the blood flow because that will simulate a VQ the matching, but uh, we do need to uh, increase it uh, a lot of times uh, to actually to improve uh, CO2 the clearance. We want to achieve the lowering of the PaCO2 uh, very gradually because there's some evidence to suggest that rapid drop in your PaCO2 at the time of initiation of ECMO can increase your risk of um, intracranial the hemorrhage. So we want to actually do it uh, in a very gradual the fashion. And the ultimate aim of the ECMO circuit is to ensure adequate oxygen delivery. And how we assess uh, adequate oxygen delivery is not just looking at SpO2, but more importantly, looking at the mix of venous uh, O2. And that goes back to basic uh, physiology. Uh, in the, when we look at animal models of um, patients uh, who are not in the shock, uh, SvO2 of uh, 70% and above basically means that uh, there is uh, a balance between oxygen delivery and oxygen consumption. Um, this SVO2 is not measured through the central line in the IJ because uh, that level is actually artificially uh, increased because our return to the cannula goes to the right uh, atrium. So you will not be able to get a good representation of what's the SVO2. But what we take as SVO2 is actually the, the drainage of cannula, blood from the drainage of cannula. So that will be the deoxygenated blood before it uh, goes through the membrane to oxygenator uh, in the ECMO the circuit. All right, so the, we measure that on a reg, on a daily the basis, and you saw on a continuous uh, basis when you can attach ultrasonic uh, flow sensor to the uh, venous uh, cannula, and that can give you a continuous uh, readout of what the SVO two. So that's actually our means of monitoring the patient's adequacy of oxygen the delivery. Uh, and uh, you can do mathematical calculation of, as well to see what is the O two the consumption and what is the um. O2 delivery and make sure that the ratio is more than three. All right, this is a little bit more tedious, involve a little bit more calculation, but in some units, this is what they actually do practice. The lactate clearance is a, a surrogate marker of organ perfusion, and it's a biochemical the marker. But obviously, there's a lot of caveat to lactate measurement, including the rate of clearance, any medication that can actually increase the lactate production. But by and large, we still want to look at the lactate to give us some rough sense that the lactate trend is actually moving downwards, which is of a favorable uh, uh, marker. And we run the blood gas uh, relatively and frequently every Q6 hours um, to make sure that, that we are achieving our goals. Because uh, the blood is actually the, um, made to go through the, uh, the ECMO the circuit, which is a foreign uh, surface, even though the, the current uh, modern the circuit as well as the membrane are made of biocompatible the, uh, material, there's still an element of a potential risk of thrombosis and activation of a coagulation the cascade. So we want to actually the, anticoagulate this patient as much as uh, possible. And anticoagulation, uh, unfortunately, do comes with risk of uh, bleeding. Um, but we do have to balance the risk of bleeding with the risk of thrombosis. Many of our patients, for example, in patients with COVID-19 or in patients uh, with a severe uh, derangement uh, in their coagulation the cascade, they are actually in a state of hypercoagulopathy. So the thrombosis is actually a very common uh, phenomenon in ECMO uh, patient. So heparin is the most common anticoagulation used, and this is our default anticoagulation in heart center. It's um, run as a uh, continuous uh, infusion. Uh, and uh, we monitor the efficacy of the uh, heparin uh, through APTT in our unit. Um, in the heart center and as well as uh, in, in the coronary care unit, as well as the characteristic uh, ICU, they tend to follow the ACT a little bit more. But I, I think regardless of which um, monitoring the system you use, you just need to be consistent. You need to know when the value seems to be incongruent with the clinical state and do other further testing to verify that the, the single level, that the single marker that you're using is actually uh, not uh, falsely uh, uh, high or falsely uh, low. Right, uh, we do have some ECMO to uh, uh, heparin to infusion to normal grams, uh, but generally this is what uh, we want to target. Uh, at more the APTT target of forty five to sixty uh, seconds, which is about uh, one point five to two times the upper limit of the APTT the range. 
And this is initiation dose of 50 to 100 units per kilogram. And this is usually given at the time of at most cannulation. And then we continued uh, at a uh, in maintenance uh, dosing and we checked the APTT there at the Q4 hourly in the initial phase. And once there's stabilization, we want to reduce the frequency of check because we know that there's a lot of fluctuation in the APTT target. So if we check very frequently, we'll end up making a lot of adjustments and we end up with a lot of fluctuations in your APTT the uh, target. When they're on ECMO, because of the risk of bleeding, we do want to keep the platelet a little bit higher. This is our internal the, uh, guidelines. Uh, CTS uh, tends to have a much higher threshold um, in terms of platelet, so they transfuse uh, a bit more uh, frequently. But uh, we generally, the, if there's uh, no clinical evidence of bleeding, we can tolerate a platelet of more than 50k. If there's clinical evidence of bleeding, we tend to aim for at least uh, 80k. But obviously, if there is a bleeding at a significant uh, site, we do want to keep this as a much higher. For example, if you have intracerebral uh, bleed, we do want to keep it at least 100k and above. Um, previously, we have talked about the hemoglobin. All right, so this is the marker that we use to optimize oxygen the content. So we do want to keep the HP a little bit higher. So we don't give, uh, so we don't uh, keep our HP target as the conventional ICU the target of seven. We tend to keep it in a much a higher range around the eight to nine. And if the patient has poor uh, oxygen the delivery, we may keep it even higher around close to 10 so that we can maximize the oxygen the content uh, through the uh, ECMO circuit. Um, renal the dysfunction is very common the, in the ECMO the patients because of the underlying the severity of the underlying the disease. And um, in patients with uh, extrapulmonary, the extra uh, cardiogenic uh, pulmonary edema, we also want to make sure that we don't flood the lungs as the, the disease has progressed. So monitoring the INOs is uh, important. In the initial phase, because uh, we are running extra corporal the circuit, and uh, we've talked about how the, the preload is a very important determinant of the ECMO flow, we do want to keep the intravascular, the volume status, close to volume as possible. So that would mean that in the initial period, we tend to keep the patient the slightly the uh, positive balance on euvolemia. It's only when the patient starts to improve from a lung perspective that we think about the fluid uh, removal. And in, in order to achieve fluid removal, sometimes we have to uh, tolerate a lower the blood flow so that we don't uh, run the problems with uh, uh, insufficient uh, preload. And if the patient uh, requires the continuous uh, kidney replacement uh, therapy, this can be either connected directly to the ECMO circuit or what we term the piggyback uh, to the ECMO circuit, or we can insert a separate uh, cannula so that the two systems are actually separate. There are pros and cons, and I won't really go through them in details, but the, the default in our unit is generally the, to piggyback to the ECMO circuit so that we can simplify the system. And uh, when you piggyback the ECMO circuit, um, and piggyback the uh, CKRT to the ECMO circuit and you are running it at a high flow um, with anticoagulation, it's very uncommon uh, for the uh, circuit uh, to fail the prematurely. In terms of analgesia and paralysis, uh, we do uh, note that uh, there's a lot of uh, unclear, uh, clarity, um, lack of clarity regards to pharmacokinetics as they go through all this extracorporeal uh, um, circuit. But our experience is that generally they need much higher doses for the same level of sedation. We don't uh, really have a preferred agent, um, although we tend to use the shorter agent uh, such as a uh, uh, proper four uh, fentanyl uh, for our sedation and analgesia purpose. But uh, sometimes uh, when the patients have high the ventilatory the need or they have high respiratory drive, we actually put them on multiple the agent. All right, but um, uh, and generally the, they might be paralyzed in the initial phase when they have a severe ARDS so that we can achieve ultra long lung protective uh, ventilation. But once we reach some stability of our, with our ECMO the circuit, we want to take them off the paralysis as much as uh, possible. And um, awake uh, ECMO to ambulation is something that um, many centers are now doing, although it comes with a lot of uh, logistic uh, challenges. So in the last uh, segment, we're going to talk about uh, some of the common uh, um, problems that you encounter the ECMO uh, circuit that you may be caught upon uh, to review. The most common scenario that you encounter is reduce the ECMO circuit uh, flow. And uh, this is the uh, defined as the inability to achieve the previously desired uh, ECMO blood flow. And uh, earlier on, we have spoke about uh, why this is uh, so 
the uh, important because once the ECMO blood flow drops, your your ability to actually provide adequate oxygen delivery will also to suffer. And uh, we have talked about how ECMO blood flow is determined by the preload, the pump function, the afterload, because they are very preload and pump function that dependent. So anything that affects the blood flow, uh, affect the pump, affects the uh, afterload, the resistance will drop your circuit, the blood flow. And you can classify the different causes based on either the patient or the circuit, the uh, specific uh, factors. Right. So this is a common uh, scenario where you actually see uh, venous uh, insufficiency due to preload the uh, um, problems. All right. So the, I'm just going to fast forward. So the, in this particular patient, the patient was flowing around the four liters and suddenly you see all this alarm where your blood flow actually suddenly dropped much below the uh, lower than the alarm setting. And uh, you can also see that uh, there is already waving of the access uh, cannula or what we term the chattling. So basically, the, this uh, means that there is a preload the problem. The venous uh, circulation, uh, venous uh, cannula is actually the, been the, um, have the veins collapsing onto itself such that a lot of suckling the problem and your flow becomes very the, inconsistent. And uh, how you can actually uh, test out the causes is looking at thinking about whether this is a circuit problem or patient problem. If this is a patient problem, uh, common causes would be things like hypovolemia or bleeding, all right? And the bleeding can be occult or overt, all right? The bleeding could be in spaces such as uh, intra-abdominal, uh, retroperitoneal, and you will not be able to easily identify. So you need to actually do a quick screen of the patient, look at the cannula, the site. You may want to repeat a chest x-ray to look at whether there's any massive uh, pleural effusion due to hemothorax. Uh, also check a gas uh, blood to see the, whether the HP is stable. So the, this is how you actually the, test out whether the patient uh, has a bleeding uh, problem. Um, the blood flow can also be interrupted because of a significant middle sinus shift. And we see that uh, sometimes in patients develop pneumothorax uh, on the ECMO the circuit. It's not uh, unusual for them to develop pneumothorax in patients near the lung uh, disease. Um, if they develop cardiac or uh, abdominal the tamponade, this could be an obstructive uh, causes uh, for uh, the preload. And uh, that may be something that uh, can be catastrophic. Cannulas are problems. Um, so the, our nurses are taught uh, to actually examine the circuitry to make sure that there's no kink in the system, there's no obstruction, or there's no overt uh, blood clots within the cannula itself. So these are the common uh, situations in which the cannula-related uh, preload uh, problem then can arise. Uh, you do also want to inspect the pump to make sure the pump is uh, properly sighted uh, into the membrane the oxygenator. Uh, if you see a lot of uh, clots or you hear a lot of whining sound that's not normally heard uh, in the ECMO the flow, that could be the sign that there could be significant uh, clots uh, forming around the ECMO the uh, inlet as well as the outlet. So once clots forms around those areas, you're going to have a resistance to the um, to preload and afterload, and that can manifest as a sudden the pump the failure. And when you see that, it's very important that uh, you do quick actions to uh, remove the pump and also exchange it for a new the circuit. Right? Uh, in emergency, the pump failure when the pump suddenly just uh, stop, you actually the, you actually need uh, to know how to uh, clamp the line, remove the uh, pump. Um, and then the change the pump the, to the hand crank and then the, and do it at the bedside. So our bedside nurses are actually taught to do this. But uh, we, I don't think I have actually recent years have encountered any overt uh, pump failure uh, per se. But uh, we do have a lot of uh, pumps uh, with uh, thrombosis or clot uh, formation. But uh, usually we can detect them much earlier. And when we detect them, we will electively change out the whole circuit rather than wait uh, for the pump to actually fail. And then you have to do an emergency the hand crank. So the, these are some of the common solutions if you have uh, inadequate uh, blood flow. So these are quite self-explanatory. Uh, as a transient, as a short-term solution, if the blood flow is very inconsistent and the patient is dropping the saturations as well as dropping the uh, uh, blood pressure in the context of a VA ECMO, what you can sometimes uh, try to do to achieve more consistent flow is to just to drop the RPM. For example, if you are running at the RPM of 4,000 to achieve a blood flow of 5, but if this is causing a lot of excess insufficiency, you can actually just temporarily reduce it to, let's say, a uh, RPM of uh, 3,000. And uh, when the blood flow is more consistent, the flow around 2 to 3 liters, you have some time to actually tie this patient over while you try to troubleshoot what is the underlying cause. 
Um, and uh, if the obstruction is due to the patient's being very agitated, bearing down on the abdomen, uh, you do sometimes need to consider about giving energy, um, analgesia and sedation. Mm -hmm. But just bear in mind that if you are giving huge doses, sometimes you can cause vasodilation. And when you have uh, vasodilation, then you can actually to reduce the blood flow. And that can actually the result uh, in the reduced uh, blood flow and hypotension. Uh, if you don't really see any obvious uh, cause in terms of uh, um, acute uh, blood loss, obstructive causes, the patient is not agitated, then uh, you can do a, a judicious uh, fluid uh, challenge to see whether that helps uh, with uh, correcting the hypovolemia. Uh, if you need to give any fluid, always think about whether you want to give a blood products, uh, in particular pack cell, because uh, at the same time that you are improving or uh, increasing the intravascular volume, you are also to, uh, topping up the HB. So if there's any excuse uh, to transfuse for such a situation, you will prefer preferably once to actually transfuse blood product rather than just pure volume. The second problem that is sometimes encountered is recirculation. So I've alluded to earlier that recirculation is uh, when uh, part of the cut, uh, of the blood that has passed through the membrane, the oxygenator, is sucked back to the pre-membrane component. So the uh, loss, loss of efficiency of the circuit and uh, um, the proportion of the blood that actually has gone through the ECMO circuit has actually dropped uh, before it returns uh, to the lung uh, circulation. Right? So the, this is not dissimilar to many of the CRT the issue where you have a recirculation the problem. And how we detect the recirculation uh, can be a few folds. One is looking at the cannula to itself. If you have two cannulas that are very, very bright, uh, this is abnormal because the venous or drainage cannula should be dark because it's deoxygenated blood. So if you have a lot of oxygenated blood flowing back uh, to the drainage uh, cannula, so both it looks very, very bright. And you can actually also the, um, do a run a blood gas on the um, venous system to look at what is the oxygenation. So if you have very high the saturations, of course, uh, this is very abnormal. And uh, clinically, the, it probably will manifest as low uh, uh, SpO2 or low SaO2 because you are reducing the amount of uh, effective uh, blood flow back to the patient's uh, system. Right? And um, the common causes of recirculation could be due to just the way that the cannulas are being placed. So the, for a double lumen cannula, if your um, return to cannula is not directed across the tricuspid valve, then you get a lot of recirculation within the right atrium. In patients with a femoral jugular configuration, if the two cannulas are very close to one another, recirculation can happen. Uh, so the, there is a preferred uh, kind of a separation between the uh, return and the venous uh, cannula that we pay close attention uh, to. But if the uh, cannula itself is not really the, if the recirculation itself is not clinically the causing uh, inadequacy of oxygen the delivery, we'd rather not uh, try to manipulate the cannula the position because that can introduce a lot of uh, problems in terms of infection to control, in terms of uh, suckling of, uh, um, of uh, atmospheric air into the uh, circulation itself. So if you can tolerate the recirculation, we'll tend to uh, just uh, leave the cannulas uh, alone. The third thing that uh, you may encounter is oxygenation to failure. And uh, you can recognize it uh, when the patient starts to have uh, low to saturations. You can see visible the clots in the membrane to itself. So our nurses and perfusionists uh, on a daily basis, or on a, even on a shift basis, will inspect the various components of the circuit, including the cannulas, including the membrane, to look for all these uh, spots. And sometimes it's very difficult to spot this because um, the uh, it's not the very the clear. The, and what we generally do, you can, dark, uh, you can uh, darken the room, use a torch light, and then the flash obliquely across the membrane to see whether there's any the, of this uh, thrombin or fibrin the, uh, formation. If a large area of the uh, membrane oxygenator are affected by, by fibrin the deposition, it will manifest also as a drop uh, in the post-membrane oxygenator PO2 the level. Right, because uh, your membrane is now less efficient in uh, oxygenating the blood uh, from the uh, uh, that is uh, going through the ECMO circuit, so your saturation as well as the PO two starts to drop, uh, and you also find that you need more and more the sweet gas to actually optimize the CO two the clearance. Uh, 
Uh, earlier on, I mentioned about uh, the pre-oxygenator and the post-oxygenator pressure gradient, or what we term the delta the pressure. This is something that we scrutinize on a daily basis because as the delta pressure becomes more and more negative, that is a reflection that the membrane oxygenator is having more and more the thrombin the deposition and more pressure the gradient. If there is a lot of uh, fibrin the deposition, uh, a lot of uh, thrombosis formation, then the coagulation or cascade uh, will be activated uh, much more uh, vigorously and you will get the, all these uh, markers of uh, um, hyperthrombosis or, 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 or hemolysis with a uh, changing level of fibrinogen, D-dimer and dropping platelet level. So this is something that we monitor patients on a daily basis when they are on the ECMO circuit. So what do we do the, if there is a membrane the failure? Well, we think about the, whether the patient is at a time point that we're suitable to consider the, uh, to facilitate earlier the weaning. If the patient is still very far off uh, from weaning of uh, the ECMO, then the, we have to change up the circuit uh, and uh, we need to optimize the anticoagulation so that we can minimize the amount of uh, thrombosis or the speed of thrombosis that's uh, developing. All right, and we see this uh, sometimes when we have to stop the anticoagulation uh, for many reasons, uh, usually the bleeding complications or to develop heparin-induced atronocytopenia, but we don't really have an alternative uh, agent in the Singapore the context. So this is an algorithm the, that uh, Melvin has actually created. So the, basically, the, you have a low saturation the state. The first thing we want to look at is whether there's a drainage uh, insufficiency and then assess for the causes of drainage insufficiency. Right? And you look at the blood flow to see whether there has been uh, any alteration to the blood flow. If there is, then you may want to optimize it. Temporary, you may need to actually increase the ventilator settings to provide some rescued uh, gas exchange. Then you check for the presence of any the recirculation. All right, So that we have talked about how we can do that. Uh, if all these are not the problems, and if it's not a problem with the membrane oxygenator as well, is this a problem with the patient where the patient has increased intrinsic cardiac output so that uh, even with the amount of uh, blood flow that you're achieving through the ECMO circuit, more blood is actually going through the intrinsic lungs. All right, so this is a common setting. Patients get agitated, have fever, have tachycardia. If so, you want to address uh, those uh, kind of uh, uh, scenarios. Uh, obviously, the, it could be just a reflection that the lung is getting worse. So if the x-ray is getting worse, the patient's lung compliance is dropped. Then you have to think about what you can do to actually optimize the uh, ECRS support. Um, then the consumption, the standpoint, is there any way that you can actually uh, maximize uh, in terms of uh, reducing oxygen the consumption? All right, so these are some of the algorithms that we can use to actually the uh, troubleshoot when your amount, when your oxygen delivery support is inadequate. In the last part, I will just quickly go through many of the things that I've already mentioned. Pump failure that we've talked about, uh, and then this is a mechanical failure. And um, if you are rotated uh, into the MO, the, into the ICU when there's an MO patient, always find out uh, from the uh, MO uh, or the ICU team how you can actually do a hand crank. Uh, circuit disruption and decannulation is catastrophic. You, your remedial action is usually to clamp the line, stop the pump. Um, do rescue ventilation on the ventilator and then quickly call uh, for help so that uh, you can actually re-establish another new uh, circuit. Bleeding is a common uh, complication. The bleeding could be at the site of cannulation or it could be at the site uh, in the outside of the uh, cannulation site. And the catastrophic bleeding area are the intracranial, uh, GI, retroperitoneal. Uh, if it happens in the brain, most of the time it's actually life uh, limiting. And, uh, and often we have to think about withdrawal of ECMO the circuit. Bleeding is a common manifestation because of uh, the ECMO circuit itself can actually induce a, a coagulopathic uh, state. And as I mentioned, we do a lot of measurements to actually to make sure that our anticoagulation target is at point. And if bleeding do occur, unfortunately, the majority of the time, we need to reverse the heparin effect with either the... Um, Protamin, uh, uh, sorry, um, in terms of uh, correcting other components of the coagulation the cascade, topping up the platelets, replacing fibrinogen. Um, very often, uh, very rarely, we have to give products like factor 10A or even protamin. We tend to hold this off because it can cause catastrophic thrombosis of the whole the circuit. If there's bleeding that's amenable to either surgical or interventional uh, intervention, uh, we tend to send them the, for embolization of the bleeding. And if the bleeding is really catastrophic, then we think about um, 
uh, palliation. Local bleeding can often uh, be resolved by just uh, local compression or putting additional stitch or getting our vascular the characteristic uh, surgeon to do a repair. And uh, pneumothoracis is uh, something that can happen and has happened multiple times. If it's not tension pneumothorax, we, we don't really have to uh, be too worried because the lungs are not really functioning anyway. Uh, unless it causes complications with your motor flow, most of the time we do not need to urgently put in a ca uh, catheter. Uh, and if we do need to put one because of hemodynamic instability, we tend to actually ask our cardiothoracic surgeon to help. We stop the uh, heparin at the, the time of cannulation so that we can minimize the risk of uh, bleeding. But we have seen a couple of cases where there's catastrophic uh, poor bleeding though, due to a poor catheter the insertion. Heparin induced thrombocytopenia is very uncommon, uh, uncommon. So the, we have not really identified a case in our local the context. Hemolysis can be significant, especially if your uh, pressure drop is very, very high when you're using a very high ECMO flow. Uh, when that happens, we have to think about reducing the MO flow and also think about whether there's any means of increasing the cannula size to support the patient a little bit more. Um, but at the end of it, if we can't really change the patient's cannula, we have to tolerate a low level of hemolysis. But the, the development of hemolysis is actually the uh, negative predictive uh, uh, factor because hemolysis causes a lot of um, activation of coagulation and inflammatory cascade, and they can actually go rapidly downhill the, with a multi-organ failure. Right? So we need to recognize if hemolysis is going on. For elective procedures, we have to stop anticoagulation. And usually this is not a problem because of venous circulation, uh, ECMO the support, you can actually run without anticoagulation to, for even up to a few days before you reach uh, any the problems. Cardiac arrest can sometimes happen because of either profound hypoxemia or they have uh, coronary the disease. When that happens, we usually just uh, conduct ACLS on our, uh, based on the ACLS uh, protocol. We don't really have to the, um, do anything to the ECMO circuit. We just let it uh, run. Uh, we need to think about uh, whether the cardiac arrest is related to complications such as cardiac tamponade or pneumothoraces. And in the right the context, you may have to think about whether this patient is a, a candidate for VA ECMO. So our cardiothoracic surgeon can actually convert the V ECMO to a VA ECMO uh, in the patients that we think is a suitable for uh, circulatory to support.